Hi folks, it's Chris again, uh, and this time we are going to talk about longitudinal analysis of microbiome using the Q2 longitudinal plugin. Uh, during this section of the tutorial, we're going to run a few new commands, including chime longitudinal volatility, which we'll get to see in a couple of different, um, more than one face of it, more than one different way we can use the same visualizer. We're going to look at chime longitudinal first distances, which calculates first distance data for us, and chime longitudinal linear mixed effects, which, as it sounds, calculates and visualizes a linear mixed effects model for us, which can be super useful. Um, so getting oriented, we have been together for a while now. We've come a long way together. Um, and most recently, we've been exploring taxonomic classification and differential abundance. Um, way back in the day, like, I don't even know how many tutorial sections ago, though, you might remember, we ran an action, a pipeline, actually, um, called Core Metrics Phylogenetic from the Q2 Diversity plugin. Um, and it produced a whole bunch of different things for us, data artifacts and visualizations, um, some of which, the emperor plots, we have come back to a few times. Um, we're going to start this section, actually, by once again using emperor plots to look at our data and see what we can learn from them um, super super powerful tools and i think it's going to be a really fun part of the conversation um, a few notes before we dive in during this section we're going to focus on beta diversity now you can also analyze alpha diversity and other things using longitudinal methods right um, but in this case, during this study, we were working with an adult population, and adult populations tend to have stable alpha diversity. So here, even though we could run some methods to, to visualize alpha diversity data, it wouldn't actually tell us anything interesting. So we're going to skip over it. Feel free to apply these tools to alpha diversity in your own time. And there's actually a really great tutorial for longitudinal data analysis available in the Chime 2 docs. Um, and linked from the tutorials. That's not something we will cover here, but is a great resource if your study or your future studies are longitudinal in nature. Um, so I guess the, the last thing I like to do at the beginning of these sections is talk about what you're gonna need. Again, we're running kind of more complicated commands this time, but with a lot of the same inputs. We need results from our core metrics phylogenetic run, we're going to need the metadata TSV, containing metadata we collected about our study. Um, and this time you're going to need like your extra best brains because some of the parameters we're going to pass in are a little more interesting. Um, why are we doing this? Why are we talking about longitudinal analysis in general? Um, well, one, longitudinal studies are common, right? Really, really powerful ways of looking at pre and post or post chase studies. Um, and measuring perturbations in data when, uh, when we do something or when something happens in an environment, right? Um, longitudinal data analysis, though, doesn't have all the same assumptions as some other like simpler types of analysis. Um, and specifically, we can't always assume that our samples are independent from one another if they are, for example, collected from the same specimen at different points in time, right? Um, and so we need some special tools here that are purpose-built to deal with longitudinal data. And also, um, I think as you'll see when we look at these visualizations, you can use other tools to look at longitudinal data, but purpose-built tools also often make it prettier. Um, and pretty data is usually easier to work with and easier to, to kind of manipulate and figure out. Um, as always, our visualizations will primarily serve to show us broad patterns, and our statistics are going to serve to um, essentially turn our metadata into quantitative uh, measures that let us test our hypotheses. All right, so in the interest of making this a little more visible for you guys, I'm going to just zoom into this page. Hopefully that makes some of these things more readable. Um, we're going to start this section of the tutorial really just following along in the tutorial itself. Um, so we will be answering these questions. 
which use the unweighted unifrac emperor plot um, that we produced back in core metrics phylogenetic. We're going to need a Q2 view window. This should look familiar. And in this tab, I have navigated to workshopserver.chime2.org slash my username, um, which is migratory mole and certainly the best username of the bunch. Um, inside of our core metrics results, then, we are looking for the unweighted unifrac and specifically our unweighted unifrac emperor dot qzv i will right click copy our link location make this a little bit bigger so that next time we're in here you guys can actually see what's going on paste that url into q2 view and here we have a lovely emperor plot this should look really familiar um, we've got this great big separation between these two groups of points and um, data is organized along axes which describe the greatest differences in our data. Uh, greatest differences specifically in the unweighted unifrac metric, right? So the questions in this section are very specific. They start by saying, open the unweighted emperor plot and color the samples by mouse ID. We can do that. I bet you could do that without, without watching along. Um, maybe if it's just a second and you can think about it, jump on it, um, and hopefully you're all successful. If you don't remember how this works, I know we've all been packing a lot into our brains in the last couple of days. Um, I'm just gonna come over here to the color tab select a color category um, and again here we were coloring by mouse id so i will color by mouse id and this gives us like a whole bunch of crazy colors all over the place right each one of these rows represents one mouse mouse id 435 437 456 and on the plot, each one of those colors represents all of the samples collected from that mouse. So all of these red dots are samples collected from mouse 435. Here, though, we're going to do something really crazy. And I, I think I'd been working with emperor plots before, like for six months before somebody told me I could even do this. We can animate these things. Um, so we are going to, like it says, click on the animations tab and animate using day post transplant as gradient and mouse ID as trajectory. So animations tab is over here on the right. Click on that. Days post transplant is our gradient. And I think they wanted mouse ID as trajectory. Now you'll notice a really cool thing happened here. Um, we've got this row of colors on mouse ID. And it matches exactly the row of colors on mouse ID from the original color plot. Um, why do we have two different settings here, right? Um, you'll see in just a moment, but what we are doing when we choose color is coloring the dots in our scatter plot or the stars if we've changed the shape or so on and so forth. Um, here, we're going to be drawing lines that connect points across some gradient of continuous data. In this case, those points are connecting time, right? Number of days post-transplant from the smallest number of days post-transplant to the largest number of days post-transplant. And so we can actually watch time playing out in our diversity metric. Um, and this trajectory selector allows us to color those lines. It's nice that the visualization gives us matching colors. Um, and we can press go. We'll actually slow this down just a little bit. We can press go and you can see how it all comes out. Now that's a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, and 
we're supposed to discern from that uh, whether we notice any clear temporal trends based on the peak away, right? Um, my first thought is like, I have no idea what just happened. And that's if that's your gut instinct too, then you're probably thinking along the right track, right? Um, if we saw a clear temporal trend, we would probably see all of our lines tracing in one direction, uh, along one axis more or less, you know, with some variation, um, describing some kind of trending change in the distance metric here, right? Um, the fact that we have all of these things kind of bouncing back and forth all over the place um, tells me that we probably don't have a super clear trend there. So depending on what your data looks like and how your brain works, um, you might find that this is a really useful or a really challenging way to visualize time. Remember that we've only got four time points in this study. Um, so even tracking a trend might be harder, given how few points there are to trace. Um, there isn't a whole lot of wiggle room when you've only got four points to, to follow along. Um, for me, though, I, I tend to find that static visualizations are often more easy to interpret at first, um, though they don't always tell the same compelling story. So here we will look at what happens if, instead of using an animation, we use uh, a coloring to, to try to describe change over time. Um, so we'll go back to this visualization. I'm going to just shift refresh. I'm going to just click on the bar and hit enter. Um, we have reloaded the visualization now. Um, and following the tutorial directions, I'm going to color again this time by days post-transplant, right? So maybe what we're doing here is trying to see if there is a, a trend in our data in some direction on the days post-transplant category. Right out of the gate, that doesn't seem to tell me a lot, but there is a better way to look at this, so we'll give that a try. We're working with, uh, in days post-transplant, a continuous um, data range, right? This is a numerical set of the number of days after transplant. And so rather than using a discrete color palette, we will go for a sequential color palette. In other words, this can happen in a kind of a series of values that follow some kind of semantically useful pattern, in this case from lighter to darker values, um, or darker to lighter maybe here. And this is a good start, but um, there's, a, there's a little catch here. If you really want this to show you the full gradient of values in a continuous, continuous um, data category, you have to click this continuous values box. You'll notice that you got a little bit more um, nuance here, and your values now range clearly from this dark purple up to this beautiful, brilliant sunflower yellow. Um, now, if we were looking for a trend in this data, we would probably be looking for a color gradient, right? Um, if, if we have a clear change in unweighted unifrac over time, we're going to see some kind of trend in this time data. And try as I might, I still see separation, um, but I don't see I don't see a strong trend here. Um, that's not super promising, but this is a kind of quick first assay. You know, we haven't put any more time into running methods to calculate this. Um, this is literally just a tool that we've already got that gives us some easy ways to look into our data. Um, negative results are still results after all. So. We won't take this as a hard no, but we will pivot and try to think about some other ways to look at our data longitudinally and see if we can find more interesting answers. The next step in our analysis will be to run the chime longitudinal volatility command um, and consider a principal coordinates volatility plot. Before I do that, I'm actually going to try to reopen that emperor plot. I right-clicked up 
in the tab bar and clicked undo close tab, which reopened my emperor plot for me. Um, I did this not because you have to, but because I really sometimes enjoy comparing and contrasting different visualizations. Um, and I think looking back at this will give us a, a sense of the utility of our principal coordinates plot, uh, volatility plot. Um, so in order to run that command, I am going to copy this guy. Um, and again, if I were if I were actually doing this analysis, I would probably just use the dash dash help parameter. Excuse me for a second. Typing in my password is the hardest thing I do at work every day. <laughs> um, I would probably chime longitudinal dash dash help and get a nice list of all of the different commands that are available so that I can confirm that what I'm looking for here is uh, feature volatility, right? Sorry, not feature volatility, is volatility. Um, and then I would chime longitudinal volatility dash dash help. And that would tell me all of the parameters that are available. Um, and it would tell me which ones are required and which ones are optional, right? A uh, table here is an optional parameter. Um, but these metadata parameters are required. Um, so in the interest of time, I will do a bad job of pasting our pasting our command in. Try again. Hit enter a couple of times. And we're going to try this whole copy paste situation again. I've been having a little trouble with this terminal. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but in a pinch, you can always copy paste the thing again. Looking at this, here's my command prompt. I've got my command and then all of the arguments that I need to pass to it. While this runs, we'll talk about what those arguments are. Ooh, maybe we won't. This is an interesting error. There was an issue with loading the file dot slash metadata TSV as metadata. It says that the metadata file path does not exist. This is a really, really common problem in running these analyses. Um, and when you see something that says a file does not exist or a file path does not exist or something like that, it's usually a good sign that you made a mistake. You can trust error messages 99% of the time. Um, and here, what's going on is that I'm going to look at all of the things in my current working directory using the ls command and realize that there is no metadata.tsv in the directory where I am right now. Um, instead, I'm going to have to navigate into the workshop directory where I do indeed have a metadata TSV. Um, so when I ran this command here, I was passing in what we call relative file paths, which means essentially starting right where you are look at your current directory and find this file in it, right? Um, and there was no metadata.tsv in the last directory where we were, so we had to go to the right directory and rerun our command. I suspect this will work better. Um, and while it runs, we'll talk through what's going on here. Um, this first metadata input is the same metadata.tsv that we've been passing in throughout. Um, this is where we have described all of the information that we know about our mice, the experimental conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, here, you've seen this pattern at least once before, because I know I've talked about it. Um, time 2 is letting us pass an artifact, in this case a PicoA results type artifact, 
as metadata. So this is being used to describe our study, essentially. Um, and that means that in this case, we're going to be plotting this PCOA results uh, data alongside our metadata. Um, we need a state column parameter. That, I believe, is required. And that describes the, um, essentially, it describes the continuous variable that we're mapping over. Uh, usually, for longitudinal studies, that means time. Right, so here we're using days post transplant for state. I think the reason we use a kind of generic descriptor here um, is because you could apply the same kind of tools to uh, other continuous variables. Um, time is just the most common one in a longitudinal study context, right? Um, we will also pass the mouse ID column name to our P individual ID column parameter. This is an optional parameter, but what this allows us to do is visualize the, um, you notice we're passing in mouse ID. These are kind of the individuals we want to, we want to think about observing. And when we see our resulting plot, you'll see that this allows us to plot a lot more information and ask more questions about these individual mice and how their uh, microbiota compositions, not composition, oh yeah, how their microbial communities changed over time, right? Um, so passing an individual ID column, though not required, is often very useful. Um, we have a default group column. This is also optional. It just sets one of our selections to start at donor status, which can be convenient, especially if you're sharing this visualization with someone else and you don't want them to have to think about setting a lot of things. Default metric works similarly, and this is the name of our output visualization. So it looks like we've got a whole new visualization, which is super exciting. It's called pcvol.qcv. And to view it, I will navigate to migratory mole refresh, you notice um, everything else in the past has been in that core metrics phylogenetic directory or core metrics results directory. Here, we told Chime2 to, to put this file in the current working directory. Um, and that can be really useful. It means that you don't just get all of your file outputs in some arbitrary place, but rather you can specify exactly where you want to put them. This isn't actually a result of core metrics, so we won't put it in the directory with the other results of core metrics. I'm opening up a new Q2 view instance, copying and pasting in the URL of the visualization, and here you have a volatility plot of principal coordinates data. Um, so what does it mean that it's a principal coordinates volatility plot? just that we are plotting principal coordinates data. So our metric here is the axis, the principal coordinate uh, that we select. We could look at axis two, we could look at axis one, we could look at axis 19 or 35 or 47 if we wanted. We'll talk about why we probably won't do that in a little bit. Um, now that we have this plot though, we're gonna take a minute and start thinking about um, kind of how we would motivate using it and then start looking for answers using the tools available. So the next question in our tutorial is a question about this volatility plot. Um, using the controls, we want to look at variation in cage along principal coordinates one, two, and three and just track what kind of patterns we see. Again, we're exploring our data here. Um, so we'll look at variation in cage along principal coordinates one through three. We will set our group column then to cage. This is the grouping of data we want to explore. We'll, we're exploring it by coloring essentially. Um, and then we will kind of flip through the axes in our data to see how 
the measure uh, is exposed. There's a really important thing to notice here. Um, we've got these like nice bright colored lines. Um, but if you look closely, there are actually a collection of very light, thin lines in the background. Um, and we'll use our control panel on the right side here to figure out what's going on there. We know our x-axis is our longitudinal axis, right? This is number of days post-transplant. This is the axis that we created using the state column parameter, um, and here it represents time. Our y-axis, our metric column, is um, it is our metric unweighted unifrac. If you remember, we passed in un unweighted unifrac PicoA data. Um, seen through the lens of these axes, right? Um, so how much difference in unweighted unifrac is represented along axis two of our principal coordinates? You notice that we've got two columns here. One controls mean lines, the other controls spaghetti lines. Um, and I'm, I'm at least a quarter Italian, so I'm, I'm inclined to, uh, to prefer spaghetti lines. Um, but they're both useful. Mean line width, if we get rid of that, essentially drops out all of these nice big bold lines. So that tells me that um, these lines describe the mean unifrac distance value for each of these cages, right? The spaghetti lines, which are here because we passed in the individual ID column parameter, um, these spaghetti lines represent each of our mice. And you'll notice that those spaghetti lines are a little different. Um, the coloring here makes pretty clear. This blue, we'll bring the opacity up too. Um, this blue here is describing cage 35 and the mice in cage 35. Um, so there are more than one mouse in cage 35, and their diversity trends as so along principal coordinate axis 2. I'm not going to get too far into this, but we have some really useful tools. We can show error bars to quantify variance. Uh, we can show a global mean to see what, essentially, what is an, an average level of diversity for these different groups or groupings. Um, and maybe most importantly, we can flip through these different axes and see, see how trends change with those axes. Um, so the first thing, the first thing I think, you know, this opens to axis two. I don't see, I don't see a particularly strong pattern here, right? There might be some kind of upward trend in cages 35 and 31. Cage 42 is pretty neutral. Cage, the other cages are kind of up and down all over the place. Um, so we may see some kind of upward trend in diversity for some of our cages over time. Um, but it's not a particularly strong signal. Axis 3 is pretty similar, kind of a garbled mess. There's this one weird outlier early on. If we hover over it, which is especially easy if we bring up the scatter points, if we hover over that point, we can see exactly which individual mouse that was and what their cage ID was. Um, and we can note that this is state 14, so this is 14 days post-transplant. Um, the really strong trend I see here is maybe not even a trend because it's not about change, but the really strong pattern I see is in axis 1. We see this really strong separation in the amount of diversity based on cage. So three of our cages, numbers 43, 44, and 49, are showing a higher level of diversity than cages 35, 31, and 42 in terms of unweighted unifrac, right? Um, which I guess makes me wonder whether we have the same kind of grouping here that we're seeing here, right? There's one really clear difference. 
And if you recall, we are in these, this is another, another look at PCOA, right? Um, we're looking at axis one separation here. So the difference described here is probably the same as the difference on axis one described here. And if instead of visualizing this on cage, for example, um, we visualize this on donor, I think that tells a more compelling story, right? It seems pretty clear that there is a difference in um, unweighted unifrac throughout the course of the experiment when grouped by donor. Um, and that that signal is probably what's causing this separation in our cage-based diversity. Um, the reason that makes sense is because our cages were uh, segregated by donor. I don't know if you recall that, uh, but it's discussed earlier in the tutorial and in these videos. Uh, cages 35, 31, and 42 housed mice who received uh, healthy control donor material, and the other three cages received Parkinson's mouse or Parkinson's patient donor material. Um, and so that is probably, maybe maybe almost certainly, the difference we're seeing. We don't have a way to quantify that here. Um, but the big difference here in cage is probably not a difference in cage. It's probably a difference in donor. Um, we're not seeing a strong cage effect. Before we leave this behind, uh, I'm going to show you a couple more things, right? I think we've answered our question generally. There's a strong separation on axis 1. The other trends in this data are pretty muddled, um, though we may see some upward trend in unweighted unifrac in our in some of our cages. Um, similarly, in some of our donors, right? Not all of them, but these healthy controls tend to become more diverse with time. Um, before we leave this visualization behind, though, I wanted to talk about why we are probably not looking at axis 47 or 42 or 31, right? This looks like a there's a lot going on here in axis 31. Um, but there's another nice little tool hidden in our emperor plot on the axes tab that gives us a really nice visualization of the percent variance explained or percent variation explained by each of our axes. Um, and so when we think about what what is causing difference here, or causing is not the right term, term but um, which axes are most closely associated with difference or best explain the difference in unweighted unifrac value. 35% of our difference is coming from axis one. Axis two accounts for only 8%. And as you move down through the axes, these are ordered according to percent variation explained, um, which means that by the time you get to axis 31, you're explaining virtually none of the difference in the, in the data at large. Um, and so even if you see a really strong trend here, it's not actually causing a major change in, in the levels of unweighted unifrac here. Um, you can then take these axis labels and the labels in this plot um, and use that to inform essentially how much you care about axis 5 or axis 10 or so on and so forth. Um, and you'll probably get the most value out of looking at axes that account for a lot of the variation explained by these principal coordinates. So we've talked about patterns, looking at variation in cage along these principal coordinates. Um, it's time to use principal coordinates to look at, look at uh, another metric. Um, so we'll use the same visualizer, but we'll give it some different parameters. And this time we will have a we'll have a very similar looking output that means some different things.
So let's get these commands running. Um, this time it's going to take two because we need to calculate some first distances using the chime longitudinal first distances command. And we'll then use those first distances to plot a uh, volatility visualization. First distances takes in a distance matrix that's required. Um, so we are giving it the unweighted unifract distance matrix that we calculated in core metrics phylogenetic. It's taking in our metadata file, a state column, which here I believe is required. Um, and this as in the uh, visualizer above is describing usually time, but some continuous variable that we want to track. Our individual ID column is mouse ID. So we want to compare uh, change in time from mouse A to mouse A to mouse A to mouse A, where each sample is, um, or where each spaghetti line describes the change in state from mouse A at 0.7 days to mouse A at 0.14 days to mouse A at 0.21 days. Um, and that kind of pairwise comparison is going to be useful for us here. Um, we're also passing this optional parameter baseline. And we will talk about that in a minute when we look at the plot. Um, but it, it kind of changes the way that we think about this visualization without changing too much about what underlies the, uh, the calculations. I'm copying the visualizer command here. It looks like we successfully produced our first distances. So I will paste in that visualizer command. We'll run that. And I don't think you're going to see anything particularly different in this visualizer's parameters. The same pattern of using an artifact as metadata. Here, we're passing in our first distances on unweighted unifrac. Metadata, study metadata. Um, our state column is again days post transplant. We're tracking change over time. Our individual ID column is mouse ID, just as in the above. Our default metric is distance, right? Um, and that we are getting from the first distances, essentially. Um, and our default group column is donor status. That's just the first grouping that is displayed when we open this visualization. Oh, we're still churning. That's interesting. Or maybe I just didn't hit enter. Yeah, that's more like it. Um, so while that runs, we'll start talking about the question we have to answer here. Um, we will again have a volatility plot. It's going to look a lot like this volatility plot. Um, and we want to know whether one donor, you know, the healthy control donor or the Parkinson's donor, changes more over time than the other. The same question applies or can be applied to genotype and to cage. Um, they're all interesting questions, and hopefully this will help us plot that kind of more directly. We have our visualization. It is in the migratory mole workshop directory. So we can come in here, hit refresh. We've got our from first unifrac volatility QZV. We'll copy the link. We'll open up a new Q2 view instance. Paste in that file. URL. And here we have a distance-based distance, distance -based volatility plot. Um, this looks, like I said, just like the other. We start out looking at these mean lines, um, but it's pretty easy to reduce the impact of those means visually or increase the impact of our spaghetti lines if that's useful to us. Um, before we try to analyze this, which will be pretty brief, um, 
we'll talk about kind of the change in meaning here, right? This looks almost identical, um, but what has changed is what our metric represents here. We're, we're plotting distance across po uh, days post-transplant. Um, and first distances, without getting too far into the weeds, is a way of plotting, um, like directly quantifying the amount of change over time. When we ran this command, we used a parameter baseline to which we passed this kind of arbitrary looking seven. Um, if you guys remember, we collected we collected samples at day seven, day 14, day 21, and day 40 something, day 49. Um, and so when we pass that baseline parameter, what we get is a plot of change over time relative to our baseline. Um, so if we, let's for a moment, look at this on a kind of mouse by mouse basis, we have these spaghettis that describe pairwise change in the community by donor for a for a given individual, right? Um, so this line describes the change in diversity on unweighted unifrac for individual number 469, starting uh, at 14 days, because all of these values are plotted relative to the seven day value. Um, so there was a lot of change from seven days at day 14. There was very little change, relatively speaking, from seven days at day 21, and something sort of in the middle at day 49. Again, there aren't a lot of samples here, or there aren't a lot of time points for us to work with. Um, especially now that we've kind of removed that day seven sample. Um, but this does give us a kind of good picture of exactly how much change is happening. So our question again was, does one donor change more over time than the other? And that's probably a good thing to look at using means, right? We don't, we don't care for that question quite as much about um, individual mice as we do about these donor groups. We'll show a global mean here. This gives us something uh, kind of to describe how far off of normal we are, or not normal, but um, average, and kind of helps us answer the question. Um, there is a little bit more change from the healthy donors over time, but not a whole lot. These are pretty similar plots. Um, you'll notice that the only metric here is distance because this is a first distances plot. So we can't really flip through anything there, but we can change which group we're looking at. And if we ask the same question about genotype, we'll see that the same is true. Um, there's, there's not a particularly strong signal. These things are staying pretty close to mean the whole time. Um, and Though there is some separation, it's not something that really screams like this is this is really important. When we look at cage ID, um, something really interesting happens because we have a clear outlier here, right? We have all of these kind of simple, simple looking lines that go kind of trending slightly up or trending slightly down. And then we have this one cage that's just completely out of whack. Cage 42 here starts super lots of difference of change and then drops way off the bottom, and then pops back up. Um, and so when I think about it, like, why do, we, why do we care that there's a lot of difference from one cage? Um, because cages are kind of a, a discrete unit of potential control in our study. Um, and so what we're looking at here is probably cage effect, right? It's bias introduced by the cage that these mice were in. Um, if we wanted, we could go a little farther in and look at the spaghettis from that cage. And we would see that indeed, both of the mice that were sampled in that cage show very similar trends. So there's, 
something really interesting happening in that cage that isn't happening in the rest of the cages. Um, and that's a thing that we may have to correct for or at least account for when we write up our results. Something went a little screwy in cage 42, um, and it's a thing that's, that might be worth talking about. Um, always better to approach those things head on than to, to avoid them. All right, it's time to move on to the final command of this section. Um, I'm going to copy paste this chime longitudinal linear mixed effects command. We'll let it run and we'll talk it through. Um, similar pattern as before, study metadata, our first unifrac, uh, first distances as um, metadata. Distance is again the column that we're interested in for our metric. Days post transplant, our time variable, is once again our state column. And mouse ID is again our individual ID column. Here, like we've done in a couple of the diversity sections, we are passing an R like formula to our model as a group columns parameter. Just as before, if you're not comfortable with R like formulas, I would encourage you to open up the docs find the linear mixed effects section. You can Google search that, or you can search it in the docs themselves, where you can just drill down from plugins, available plugins, longitudinal to linear mixed effects. And there's a really nice description in here of what means what um, and how, how those formulas are constructed with some good outside resources. We'll clean up these other plots. We'll take a look over here. It looks like we've got an LME visualization. So we can update this. Open a new view. Linear mixed effects is another multivariate method that allows us to model the ways in which effects um, and interactions between those effects influence some given metric. Or uh, here it's distance, which is unweighted unifrac in this context. Um, when I first open one of these visualizations, the first thing I do is kind of sanity check that I did the right thing. So I look at this long form formula, and we're looking at interactions between genotype and donor over time. So that, that works. Um, our distance, groupings, state, and our time variable, essentially, and individual ID things all make sense. And then I'll come down here and take a look at, at scale. Um, I would usually expect this to be a higher value, probably closer to one. That is uh, a number that I was given by a, a better statistician than I will ever be. I am not a statistician. Um, but if you get a really low scale value, it, it might be a sign to you that there's something not quite, not quite as expected. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Our model results section is where things start getting interesting um, because this is where we get the statistics that actually describe the relationship between our terms like intercept, uh, genotype, wild type, donor, PD1, and our metric. Um, the syntax here is a little challenging, so we'll talk about that for a moment. Um, when you read genotype wild type, what you're reading is really, um, we're looking at genotype and specifically the group of genotype samples that are described by the wild type category, right? So this, this row describes our wild type genotype only. This row describes our PD donor only. These colons indicate that this is an interaction term. So this is the interaction between genotype and wild type. This is the interaction between days post transplant genotype and, and donor. Um, and you know, you, you might the first question that came to mind for me was like, well, if we've got wild type, where 
where is the uh, humanized mouse term? And the answer is that essentially we select one of each of these groupings and the others get dropped into this intercept term. So the intercept term is uh, complex to analyze to say the least and it's not something that we'll be covering here. We will take a higher level reading instead um, and I think that'll be sufficient to our needs. Um, so while I'm flipping around I'm trying to find the questions that we're trying to answer during this section of the tutorial. Um, the first question is, is there a significant association between the genotype and temporal change? And so when I come back to our model results, I would first look for the interaction between genotype and temporal change, days post-transplant and genotype, and read across. There's a relatively low coefficient value. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and these, these columns essentially represent the construction of our model, um, the production of this Z um, statistic, which is our test statistic, um, and ultimately the, the development of a p-value. Here you'll notice the absolute value sign. This is a two-directional, so this is the probability that we get a more extreme value than z on either side. Interaction between days post-transplant and, sorry, between genotype and days post-transplant is 0 0.031. That is not super mighty, but for uh, most studies, that is a statistically significant p-value. Before we start celebrating, though, uh, it's really important to remember that these p-values describe um, the, the degree to which these terms explain unifract distance within the context of our model, right? I mentioned earlier that our scale term was very low here, um, and as we'll see in a little bit, there may be some problems with the, the assumptions we've made about our model. Um, that tell us that this is, though initially promising, um, maybe our model doesn't fit our, our data well enough to actually be useful. We're going to carry on with this part of the analysis um, as, if, as if we don't see that already. Um, but the reality is that we may not be able to use these results, even if they look really promising initially. So we have answered our first question. There is a significant association between genotype and temporal change. We want to know next which genotype is more stable, right? Where is there, where is there less variation over time? Um, and for that, we're going to roll down to the next section of this pretty awesome visualization. We have these regression scatter plots. Um, on the x-axis, you have days post-transplant. On the y-axis, you have distance. That, again, is our unifract distance, unweighted unifract distance. Um, and so if we want to understand which of our genotypes is more stable, we're essentially asking which of our genotypes has less change in diversity over time? Which of these two lines has the lower slope, right? So here, our wild type is, whoop, that's such a cool feature. Um, our wild type is a flatter line and therefore is a more stable community. While we're looking at this regression scatter plot, though, I want to point out some, some kind of challenging things about what we're seeing here. Um, first is that we have a, a whole lot of variation in the plot, you know, you'll notice that these points are intermixed and um, cover a tremendous amount of vertical distance here. Um, that may that may be problematic. Um, the these error bars are pretty significant, um, and so we will we will in a little bit look at what that means for us and and whether whether the results that we're trying to find here, the questions we're trying to answer, can actually be answered with this model. On to our third question, 
uh, we want to know whether there is temporal change associated with the donor. And it's worth thinking about whether or not we expected this based on our volatility plot results. Um, I made the mistake of cleaning up too soon. So I'm going to reopen our volatility plot, copying that QZV, pasting the URL into Chime2 view. And we're interested in donor. And so we will look once again at our linear mixed effects model. We're going to head down to the donor plot. Um, and we want to know whether there is a, quote, temporal change associated with donor. Um, and much like we saw in that principal coordinates based volatility plot, um, our healthy mouse group appears to be trending upwards significantly in un unweighted unifrac distance over time. Um, so we have a pretty good alignment between what that healthy control group is doing here in our linear mixed effects, effects model and what the healthy control group is doing in the PC volatility plot. Um, I would have expected this. And we do see a temporal change associated with donor. Finally, can you find an interaction between the donor and genotype? So we're back to the LME. Um, and we look at our interaction between donor and genotype. We have a p-value of 0 0.005. This is one of the, the stronger p-values in this model. Um, and if the model's assumptions hold, then uh, this would tell us that there is indeed a strong relationship between genotype and donor, um, or a strong interaction between genotype and donor and the effect that they have on unweighted unifrac distance. There is, however, one more part of this, this visualization that we really need to consider. Um, and in a real analysis, you might look at these residual plots immediately after looking at your model parameters and model, uh, sorry, model summary. Um, essentially during that fact-finding, like dummy checking part of, of reading the visualization because you don't want to spend a lot of time asking questions about your model results if your model doesn't fit. Um, and so what we see here is, is, uh, is similar to what we were seeing in the alpha and beta diversity sections of the tutorial, where these residuals, um, because this model assumes data normality, these, these residuals should be zero-centered, right? So we should have a mean at zero, which we see here. Um, there also shouldn't be systematically high or low values, though. And so what we see when we see that change in variance over time um, is, a, is an amazing word that is worth looking up on, on Wikipedia, heteroskedasticity. Heteroskedasticity? I don't know. Um, but the idea is that... Uh, Variance is different across different terms in your model. Um, and so here we clearly have this trend where our, um, our healthy controls are showing a dramatic increase in variance over time. Um, and that kind of pattern in those, in those plotted points probably indicates a poor model, right? Um, it means that Linear mixed effects is probably not the right model choice for this data set. Um, so I guess I, I want to thank you for bearing with me through the, the like faux analysis of the LME visualization. Hopefully that will be useful when you have data that does fit an LME model well. Um, you can look at all of these things, answer real questions, and hopefully what we've done here gives you a picture of how you might start doing that. Um, but at the end of the day, all of the statistics that you see up here are only valid within this model. And if the model is not an appropriate model for your data, 
then you have to start looking to other models. So our, our top level takeaway here um, is that linear mixed effects is probably not a good way of describing our data. Um, we're not going to take any really concrete results out of that because this is not the best model for what we have here. Um, another likelihood method would probably be a better approach. Um, and there's probably a relatively complex interaction between the terms here that is worth teasing out with further study. So I always like to end these sections with a summary. Um, and before, before I summarize everything we've done, I'm going to just start with a quick summary of our LME visualization. When I open one of these things up, there's a lot of material here, right? So my process is first, Look at, my, look at my parameters and make sure I didn't type something dumb and uh, you know, not include the interaction terms I wanted, for example. Um, or not put the right ID in for individual ID. Assuming I did everything right there, I'll come down to model summary and just make sure that everything feels like it's describing my data accurately. Um, and maybe keep an eye out for a scale term that is really low as a potential red flag. I'll look down at the projected residuals, see what I can learn from them, and mostly make sure that our residuals are roughly zero-centered, normal, and don't show any major systematic trends, right? Um, if that all happens, then it's time to really start looking at these regression scatter plots and model results, which can tell us a lot about how these different terms explain the, the changes in diversity over time, um, or the, the interactions between terms and uh, our diversity metric. Zooming out, we did a, a ton here with longitudinal study, um, and we didn't even scratch the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are a ton of other methods available in Q2 longitudinal. Um, a personal favorite is the feature volatility method, which lets you look at volatility on a per feature basis. Um, so if your features are OTUs or ASVs, um, to what degree is beta diversity volatile for a given feature over time? Um, and that's a really neat way to start looking at uh, maybe what features are interesting to you as you start mapping out change of your community over time, if you want to target species and do further work. Um, big picture, coming back to our tutorial, um, we have done a bunch of digging into longitudinal volatility visualizations. We've calculated some first distances here, tried out a bunch of new commands. Um, we found differences in how the microbiome changed over time in mice with different genetic backgrounds, which does support our hypothesis, which is super awesome. Um, unfortunately, our linear mixed effect model probably isn't a good model for our data. Um, and so probably our next step, if we're interested in longitudinal analysis, is to find another model that works better and see whether, uh, see whether we can learn interesting things about those multivariate interactions in terms. I hope this has been helpful. I hope you guys have a wonderful end of the workshop. It's been really fun presenting and I look forward to speaking to you in the discussion section.